Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Kimberly Carpenter will present Sensory Challenges and Anxiety in Children with and Without Autism. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $418 million to fund more than 6,000 grants around the world. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Kimberly Carpenter. Dr. Carpenter is assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Duke University School of Medicine. She was a BBRF 2015 Young Investigator grantee. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Carpenter's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time. Following the presentation, I'll ask as many as possible in the time allotted. And now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Carpenter. Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Jeff. Can you see my slides? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. I'm excited to share some of the work that my colleagues and I have been doing to understand the relationships between sensory challenges, particularly sensory over-responsivity or sensory hypersensitivity and anxiety in young children. So to start with, I wanna share that anxiety disorders are actually relatively common in young children. So my colleagues have reported that around 19% or about one out of five preschool age children meet criteria for an anxiety disorder. Furthermore, data from the Great Smoky Mountain study, which I'll talk about in a minute, suggests that anxiety disorders are present across early childhood and adolescence. Though there is an overall U-shaped curve, as you can see here, um, where there's higher levels between the ages of 9 and 10, which then drop in middle to um, early adolescence and then increase again, the actual cumulative prevalence across this period is relatively high. So what I mean by cumulative prevalence is that the rate of any individual person having an anxiety disorder between the ages of 9 and 26 is around 22.7%. So for those that are not familiar with the Great Smoky Mountain Study, or GSMS for short, the GSMS study is an amazing longitudinal study that first started at Duke in the early 1990s to examine the prevalence and development of childhood psychopathology in a community sample of over 1,400 children who were recruited from rural counties in Western North Carolina. So what's important to appreciate here is these weren't children who were referred to the lab or to a clinic because they already had anxiety disorders or other disorders, but instead were recruited from this broader community. So to think that as many as one in five of these individuals meet criteria for an imperial anxiety disorder by the time that they are 26 really tells you that this is a highly prevalent, early emerging and important problem. But not only are these disorders common and impairing in childhood and adolescence, but data from a number of large community samples around the world have demonstrated that they also increase the risk of lifelong difficulties with mood disorders, including both anxiety and depression. In fact, adolescent anxiety is associated with a 2.8 times greater odds of having anxiety as an adult. It's also associated with 1.85 times greater odds of having depression in adulthood. Now, while the prevalence of anxiety in children without autism is about 19 to 
In children with autism, the rate of anxiety is double that. So one study that used the same tool as was used in the GSMS study, so is um, a nice equivalent, showed that approximately 40% of all children with autism meet criteria for an impairing anxiety disorder. Despite the early emergence of anxiety symptoms and the long-term impacts on the lives of individuals with autism, many current interventions focus on alleviating symptoms in older children and adults who already suffer from an anxiety disorder. By the time most children receive these treatments, they've already developed a number of co-occurring challenges, including difficulties with sleep, recurrent stomach aches, higher levels of picky eating, and increased irritability, which further impair both the child and their family's functioning. In addition to this, co-occurring anxiety has also been linked to increased core autism symptoms, including more difficulties with social interactions and more repetitive behaviors. So in order to prevent the significant impairment that results from anxiety, the ideal treatments would target child behaviors or features that are associated with risk for anxiety before full-blown anxiety emerges. The goal of this strategy would be to aim to be to reduce or prevent the onset of both the anxiety symptoms and these associated co-occurring challenges, rather than treat them after they've already become impairing for the child and their family. So one potential risk factor for anxiety is sensory over-responsivity. Sensory over-responsivity is characterized by heightened and unusual reactions to everyday sensory stimuli. So now I'm gonna say something that I hope will not be either surprising nor provocative. Just about every aspect of our lives is driven by how our senses perceive our environment. So right now, I hope that your primary sensory input is the sound of my voice and the ocean scene on my slide. You're probably not paying attention to the sound of the heat or the air conditioning wherever you are if it's on, the feel of the tag of your shirt, or even the smell of the coffee or tea on your desk. And you're probably not noticing the flicker of a fluorescent light above you if there is one. Or at least you weren't aware of those things before I said that. Now you might be acutely aware of at least one or two of these things. Now imagine if you weren't able to filter out that irrelevant sensory information. That would be really hard, right? Well, this is what happens in about 56% of individuals and children who have autism. What's even more striking is that in addition to being prevalent in children with autism, sensory ch uh, challenges are also one of the earliest and most persistent concerns reported by parents of children who go on to develop on to autism. So in fact, in a study by Sacre and colleagues who recruited children who are at high risk of developing autism because they had an older sibling with autism, they found that when they surveyed the parents about the developmental concerns about their child that was at high risk, they found that at multiple time points between six and, oops, sorry, I lost my mouth, six months and three years of age, uh, sorry, where did my mouth go? There it is, okay, six months and three years of age, they found that sensory symptoms were the most early arising and the most prevalent concerns reported in the parents of high-risk children who received an autism diagnosis as compared to the parents of high-risk children who did not receive an autism diagnosis and as well as parents of children who were not at high risk. So these sensory challenges, as I said, were noted as early as six months of age, even before other more classic autism symptom domains, such as the play skills and social skills, became a concern. So how could these early sensory challenges contribute to the high rates of anxiety in children with autism? Well, as I alluded to a few minutes ago, imagine that instead of just being a nuisance that you can't ignore, that sensory experiences actually cause you to stress. So for example, say you have a young boy, we'll call him Tommy, Tommy is out to dinner with his parents and he needs to use the restroom at the restaurant. 
He walks into the restroom, and just as he walks in, without any warning to him, someone activates the automatic hand dryer. Now, unfortunately for Tommy, this sound causes his sensory system to react in a way that's similar to how I react when someone scrapes their nails on a chalkboard. I literally get chills just bringing that up. Well, how do you think Tommy's going to react? Perhaps he will quickly throw his hands over his ears to filter out the sound. Perhaps he will run straight out of that restroom. Now imagine that the following week, Tommy goes to the mall with his mom, and he again needs to use the restroom. Just as before, someone is using the automatic hand dryer as Tommy goes in. Now at this point, Tommy's brain has made a very clear connection between the sound of the hand dryer and the public restroom. Now this is not an uncommon experience for many children. I remember my own child being quite distressed the first time he went into a public restroom where there was one of those automatic flushing toilets. And because he was so small, the toilet kept flushing even while he was still using it. This is so common that it took me maybe five seconds to Google what to do and found that there was lots of information on the internet that there's a pro-parenting hack where you take a piece of toilet paper, place it over the sensor so it doesn't go off before you're ready for it to, and then the, the child doesn't have to deal with this. You're welcome if you have young children who have not yet experienced this. The problem for Tommy, though, is that his brain is wired to be overreactive to these experiences. And now that Tommy has learned that in order to not have these negative sensory experiences, it's probably best that he just avoids public bath bathrooms altogether, which he begins to do. Now, this becomes a significant problem for both he and his family, because they can no longer be away from home for extended periods of time for fear that Tommy might have to use the bathroom. If they do find themselves away from home and Tommy has to go to the bathroom and they try to make him, he ends up screaming, he cries, he refuses to go in, and he's even wet himself on a number of occasions because of this. Now, this has caused the family to avoid leaving the house with Tommy unless it's absolutely necessary. His mom is worried about what they will do when it's time for him to go to school. Is he still going to be in diapers? You can see how this can very quickly become impairing for a family. But now what would happen if the cause of someone's distress is not something as predictable as a hand dryer that you will only encounter in a public bathroom? What if it's everyday noises? Well, that's the experience of many people with autism. So take these excerpts from an article that shared in their own voices the sensory experiences of adults with autism. The first person reported that high sounds like sirens and whistles hurt my ears and sudden sounds like a car horn, and loud sounds, and booming sounds like waves on the beach, and roaring sounds like a vacuum cleaner or lawnmower cause them distress. These are sounds that you can encounter just walking down the street without any warning. Another individual reported a similar experience, sharing that loud, high-pitched noises hurt my ears before they become loud enough to bother most people at all. Sudden, loud, impulsive sounds like shutting doors and most fireworks also cause me pain. Can you imagine this? How many times a day do you hear the sound of a door shutting in your house or at your office? At least a handful every day, right? And you don't necessarily know when it's gonna happen. Well, in these cases, the unpredictability of these everyday sounds may cause these individuals to remain in a constant state of hyperarousal and hypervigilance so that he or she is prepared to react the instant that they encounter one of these negative sensory experiences. This is in contrast to the more predictable experience in the hand dryer example, where the predictability of the stimulus led our character Tommy to avoidance and phobia of bathrooms. Now these two sequences of events have been hypothesized by Green and colleagues to be potential pathways by which sensory over-responsivity could lead to anxiety disorders. These constructs have been the topic of increasing research over the past decade, with a number of groups finding compelling evidence for a relationship between sensory over-responsivity and anxiety in children with autism. So for example, our group has found a positive relationship between sensory over-responsivity and anxiety symptoms in a sample of 69 three to six-year-old children with autism. You can see this depicted in this plot over here on the left, where the bottom axis represents levels of sensory over-responsivity, with positive values representing high levels of over-responsivity, and negative values representing lower levels. The left side of the axis has our sum of anxiety symptoms in these children, 
And what you can see is that the children over here on the right that have the highest level of sensory over-responsivity also have the highest number of anxiety symptoms. Now this replicates previous findings from a number of groups referenced at the bottom of the slide, underscoring really the robustness of this relationship. Now this includes symptoms of all anxiety disorders added together. The next question is whether this relationship is general to anxiety overall or whether sensory over-responsivity is related to particular subtypes of anxiety as predicted by the model discussed a minute ago. In our study, we found that children with autism who had the greatest levels of sensory over-responsivity were 22 times more likely to meet criteria for generalized anxiety and 10 times more likely to meet criteria for separation anxiety, as can be seen in these odds ratio plots down here on the bottom right. Again, this is similar to what's been found by others. Um, notably though, in our study, the hypothesized relationship to specific phobias was not found. I have to say though, our measure of phobias was not ideal for use in children with autism. And I say that because there's good evidence that anxiety disorders, including specific phobias, often manifest in different ways in children with autism than they do in children without autism. And so because of this, my colleagues and I are embarking on further studies where we'll use a measure developed specifically for assessing anxiety in children with autism so that we can better answer whether this is a real finding. So while my data does not currently support the predicted relationship between sensory over-responsivity and specific phobias, I think we need to do more in-depth research before we can say definitively that that's the case. Now these data are all looking at the relationships between anxiety and symptoms of sensory over-responsivity. If we look at just those children for whom their sensory over-responsivity is clinically elevated, meaning in this case that their sensory symptoms were greater than two standard deviations above norms on a parent report measure, the sensory experiences questionnaire, we see an even more striking relationship. So specifically, we found that in our sample of preschoolers with autism, almost all who had clinically elevated levels of sensory over-responsivity, 20 or 98%, met criteria for an impairing anxiety disorder. Importantly, however, the opposite was not the case. So as you can see in this box, 40% of children with autism who met criteria for an impairing anxiety disorder did not have clinically elevated levels of sensory over-responsivity. So taking this all together, this data suggests that there's a clear connection between sensory over-responsivity and anxiety in preschool-aged children with autism. But it also suggests that there's more to the story, since not all children with co-occurring autism and anxiety also have sensory over-responsivity. So this leaves open the question of just how sensory over-responsivity and anxiety may be linked in children with and without autism. There are at least two possible mechanisms that have been hypothesized. Either it could be that sensory over-responsivity precedes anxiety, or it could be that sensory over-responsivity is an early manifestation of anxiety in children with autism. Without longitudinal data, it's impossible to know which of these is the case. Luckily, other researchers have been able to explore this in a longitudinal sample of children with autism. So in the first study that I'm aware of, to explore the temporal relationship between sensory over-responsivity and anxiety, Green and colleagues recruited a sample of young children with autism and measured their sensory over-responsivity and their anxiety when they were between 18 and 33 months of age and then again one year later. Using this sample, they explored whether sensory over-responsivity predicted anxiety at time two, as well as the opposite pattern, whereby anxiety at time one predicted sensory over-responsivity at time two. Through this analysis, they were able to demonstrate that sensory over-responsivity predicts change in anxiety over toddlerhood. They did not, however, find the opposite. Whereby sensory, or sorry, whereby anxiety at time one predicted sensory over responsivity at time two. 
This supports the idea that sensory over-responsivity does precede anxiety symptoms, at least in children with autism. What about children who don't have autism? While much of the research on sensory over-responsivity has been conducted in children with autism, where sensory over-responsivity is most common and is even actually part of the diagnostic criteria, there's now also evidence for a relationship between sensory over-responsivity and anxiety in children who don't have autism, including children with ADHD, individuals with anorexia, and children without any of these disorders. So that leads us to the question, what if the mechanisms by which sensory over-responsivity contributes to anxiety differ in children without autism? Understanding this could have important implications for how one may approach treatment. If the pattern is the same, regardless of whether a child has autism or not, then the same treatment approaches may be applicable across individuals. Now, if the mad mechanism by which sensory over-responsivity contributes to anxiety is different in children with and without autism, then we need to consider that the treatment approach could also need to differ. So the first step to figuring this out is to explore whether sensory over-responsivity predicts anxiety in one of these other groups. So my colleagues and I set out to do exactly that. We explored whether the same relationship between sensory over-responsivity and anxiety was true in children who were recruited from the community. So in this study, referred to as the Duke Preschool Wellbeing Study, research assistants went into three Duke pediatric primary care clinics and screened over 3,000 preschoolers who were attending their well-child visits for symptoms of anxiety disorders. Of these 3,000 children, all of the children who screened high and a random subset of children who screened low were invited to participate in a study of early childhood mental health. The research team then went out to the homes of 917 of the children and completed a comprehensive psychiatric interview called the Preschool Age Psychiatric Assessment, or the PAPA for short. The PAPA is a comprehensive caregiver reported interview that assesses symptoms for a range of psychiatric disorders, including anxiety in preschool aged children. In addition to assessing for the classic DSM disorders, the PAPA also asks questions about the child's development, their family, and other important behaviors, including symptoms of sensory over responsivity, sleep difficulties, and eating habits, among other things. I do want to note that importantly, in order for a child to meet criteria for any psychiatric disorder on the PAPA, anxiety included, the parent has to provide information about the symptoms being impairing for the child. This helps protect against pathologizing normal levels of behavior. So the PAPA in this study was given to the parents of these 917 children when they were between two and five years old. The team then got a second grant that allowed them to follow back up with 191 of the kids and repeat the PAPA interview when they were six years old. Because the samples were drawn from a community sample of children from pediatric primary care, it allows us to use what's called sampling weights to estimate the prevalence of each of these disorders in the broader population using just the 917 children that were given the interview. With this incredible sample, we were able to first explore baseline rates of sensory over-responsivity in a relatively large community sample of preschool children. And what we found was that 20.5% of our sample, which was again weighted back to that original screening sample of over 3,300 children, met criteria for at least one sensory over-responsivity during the preschool period, with the two most common sensitivities being tactile hypersensitivity, which was reported in 18% of the sample, and auditory hypersensitivity, which is reported in 4% of the sample. Interestingly, the proportion of females for whom parents endorsed at least one sensory over-responsivity in the preschool period was higher than the proportion of boys, and sensory over-responsivity was also more common in children who fell below the federal poverty line in our sample. Now, using the longitudinal data, we were able to also demonstrate that sensory over-responsivity is relatively persistent across childhood. Specifically, of the children with sensory over-responsivity at preschool who were assessed again at school age, 
56% of them still had parent reported sensory over responsivity at that follow up visit. Interestingly, there were also a subset of children who may have developed sensory over responsivity later in, in childhood, with 16% of them reporting to have at least one sensory over responsivity by school age when they did not have any reported sensory over responsivities back when they were preschoolers. So how does sensory over responsivity relate to anxiety in our sample? Well, we first wanted to explore just the cross-sectional relationship between sensory over responsivity and anxiety in that full sample of 917 preschool age children. And we found that in this sample, 43% of children with sensory over responsivity met criteria for at least one impairing anxiety disorder. When we explored whether this was specific to an individual type of anxiety disorder, we found that the relationship was significant across all three anxiety disorders studied, with 30% of children with sensory over responsivity meeting criteria for separation anxiety, 19% meeting criteria for generalized anxiety, and 15% meeting criteria for social phobia. Furthermore, the relationship between sensory over responsivity and psychiatric disorders was not specific in this cross sectional sample for anxiety. In fact, 21% of the children who had sensory over responsivity as a preschooler also met criteria for other preschool disorders, such as ADHD and depression. But what about the longitudinal data? So is the same pattern as was seen in autism, whereby sensory over-responsivity predicts later anxiety, seen in the sample of children without autism? Yes, it was. So we found that sensory over-responsivity in the preschool period significantly and positively predicted anxiety symptoms at six years old. This relationship remains significant even when controlling for other potential confounding variables like sex, age, race, and SES. It continued to remain significant when we added both preschool anxiety symptoms and school-age sensory over responsivity symptoms to the model. So what does that mean? <laughs> this suggests that neither concurrent sensory over responsivity nor the interrelationship between sensory over responsivity and anxiety in the preschool period accounted for the increased rates of anxiety at six years old. It also suggests that this relationship is not being driven by increased preschool psychopathology in general. So we then asked the question of whether the relationship between having preschool sensory over responsivity was associated again with any individual anxiety disorder or whether it was just general to all anxiety disorder study. And we found that in this longitudinal relationship, the the finding was predominantly driven by children who met criteria for generalized anxiety. So in this case, preschool sensory over responsivity was associated with a 2.6 fold increased risk for meeting criteria for generalized anxiety disorder. It was not associated with either separation anxiety or social phobia in the longitudinal analyses. But now remember that in the cross-sectional analyses, many children already had both sensory over-responsivity and anxiety by the time they were preschoolers. There was also that subset of children who had new symptoms of sensory over-responsivity at the six-year-old follow-up interview. And sensory over-responsivity was associated not only with anxiety disorders, but also with other disorders like ADHD. So to test the specificity of the relationship between preschool sensory over responsivity symptoms and school age anxiety symptoms, we conducted two additional analyses. First, we tested the hypothesis that the relationship between symptoms of sensory over responsivity and anxiety symptoms was bidirectional. Now, although preschool sensory over responsivity significantly predicted school age anxiety in the models described in the previous slide, the opposite was not the case. So preschool anxiety symptoms did not significantly predict school-age sensory over responsivity. Second, we tested the hypothesis that preschool sensory over responsivity predicts school-age psychiatric disorders more generally, and thus is not specific to anxiety symptoms. 
again, we found that there was not a significant relationship between sensory, preschool sensory over-responsivity symptoms and other non-anxiety disorders at school age. So together this means that having at least one sensory over-responsivity as a preschooler is both unidirectionally and specifically associated with increased risk of having an anxiety disorder at six years old. I think this is incredible because it really supports what our clinical colleagues, especially our occupational therapists, already knew, that treating sensory over-responsivity early in life could have profound impacts on improving the outcomes of children who may otherwise go on to develop anxiety. Building on this, if you remember earlier in the talk, I mentioned that anxiety is associated with a number of additional challenges in children with autism. Well, the same is true in children without autism. Anxiety in children regardless of whether they have autism or not, has been linked to increased sleep difficulties, such as bedtime resistance, rising to check on family members, more GI symptoms, including abdominal pain, constipation, and diarrhea, higher levels of picky eating, which includes things like food refusal and food aversion, and also increased irritability, where there's two kind of phases of irritability. There's the basic symptoms of irritability, which are temper tantrums and temper outbursts, and then the tonic symptoms of irritability, which include kind of easily annoyed and angry. Critically though, in addition to the fact that all of these have been linked to anxiety, previous work has also linked these to sensory over-responsivity. So that led our team to ask the question, if preschool sensory over-responsivity predicts anxiety at six years old, and both sensory over-responsivity and anxiety have been independently linked to sleep difficulties, irritability, GI issues, and picky eating, then is it that sensory over-responsivity and anxiety are independently linked to these outcomes and maybe work together to make them worse in a compounding way? Or is it that the relationship between sensory over-responsivity and later behavioral challenges is actually a consequence of sensory over-responsivity leading to anxiety. Or statistically speaking, does anxiety mediate the relationship between sensory over-responsivity and behavioral challenges? What we found was that, yes, anxiety mediated the relationship between sensory over-responsivity and both sleep difficulties and irritability in our sample. So in non-statistical terms, what this means is that children who had sensory over-responsivity as preschoolers also had higher levels of anxiety symptoms by the time they were six years old. And this in turn was related to higher levels of sleep difficulties and irritability at school age. We did not find the same pattern for either GI issues or picky eating in our sample, Though we have some hypotheses about how we measured these and quantified these behaviors, so I think this, that finding needs some more follow-up before we can totally rule that out. Whew, okay, that was a lot of information. So let's take a moment to reflect before I totally switch gears on us. Here's what I've shared so far. Both sensory over-responsivity and anxiety disorders are common and impairing in young children both with and without autism. Sensory over-responsivity in the preschool period specifically and unidirectionally predicts anxiety symptoms at school age. And school age anxiety symptoms mediate the relationship between preschool sensory over-responsivity symptoms and both sleep problems and irritability at school age in children without autism. And spoiler alert, we're finding that the same is true in children with autism. More to come in the coming months on that though. So all of the data that I've spoken about to this point has been clinical, but I'm actually a neuroscientist. So my next question is, how does all of this relate to brain function? What is the potential brain basis of the transition from sensory over-responsivity to anxiety disorders? Now, you might be asking, why do we even care? And it's a fair question. But I would argue that if we can start to understand the neurobiology of this relationship, we may be able to identify biologically relevant markers for these difficulties that could help us serve to identify things like which children are most likely to respond to a particular treatment, or 
we may be able to identify biological endpoints that we can then use in clinical trials to track the success of treatment. If we understand the underlying neural circuitry of sensory over-responsivity and anxiety and how it is Im impacted in different individuals, we may even be able to use that information to help us individualize treatments, just like oncologists use the molecular information from tissue biopsies to drive treatment plans for their cancer patients. So what do we know about the brain, sensory over-responsivity, and anxiety? Well, the way in which the brain processes potentially threatening stimuli is actually pretty well understood. So let me introduce you to my two favorite brain regions. Yes, neuroscientists often have favorite brain regions. It's one of our quirks. So my first favorite brain region is the amygdala. The amygdala plays a critical role in driving our reactions to stimuli in our environment. So say, for example, that you're walking along a trail and you see something that could be a snake. Your amygdala is the brain region that sounds the alarm that there is a potential danger and sets off the fight or flight response, increasing your heart rate and your blood pressure and preparing your muscles for action in case you need to run. Now, my second favorite region is the prefrontal cortex. So what happens if you realize that you did not actually see a snake, but instead it was just a coiled up rope that looked like the snake? Well, the prefrontal cortex plays a role in telling your amygdala that all is well and helps it put on the brakes for that fight or flight response. My colleague, Dr. Raj Mori, has a fantastic analogy that I'm stealing for how the amygdala, I asked permission, for how the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex work together to regulate one's emotional responses. He compares it to a San Francisco streetcar, where the streetcar is like the amygdala, and the engineer working the brakes is like the prefrontal cortex. So in this analogy, the amygdala is like the streetcar that if not kept under control by the prefrontal cortex, or the streetcar in this example, it will go careening down this hill completely unchecked, which seems pretty much terrifying to me. It is through the nuanced engaging and disengaging of the brakes that are in the engineer's hands in this picture that allows the streetcar to climb the giant hills of San Francisco and then to control itself as it descends on the other side of that hill. The prefrontal cortex plays a similar role in controlling the amygdala in the brain with it disengaging its controller of the amygdala in the case of seeing a potentially threatening snake on your path and re-engaging control of the amygdala once it's been determined that there's no actual threat. Now, when the delicate balance get between a, the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala gets disruptive, you move from adaptive anxiety and towards more unchecked anxiety. And this can lead to both hypervigilance, and avoidance, which if you remember, I mentioned earlier, earlier were the hypothesized pathways by which sensory over-responsivity can lead to anxiety. Now, data from both our group and others has shown that this is indeed similar to what may be happening in the brain of individuals who have both sensory over-responsivity and anxiety. So again, returning to the Duke Preschool Wellbeing Study, as part of that follow-up study, which was actually called the Learning About the Developing Brain Study, 83 children came back and participated in a functional MRI scan where we studied how their brains processed faces depicting different emotions such as anger and fear. And what we found was that meeting criteria for an anxiety disorder during the preschool period predicted decreased connectivity between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex at school age. So, if you look at this picture on the left, you can see the functional brain response to different emotional faces in children with social phobia, children with generalized anxiety, and children with separation anxiety. In each of these, the blue blobs, which is of course a very technical term for the brain activation, represents parts of the prefrontal cortex that show decreased connections with the amygdala in children with these anxiety disorders compared to children without anxiety and to each other. There are two striking, at least to me, takeaways from what we found. So first, these analyses, um, or in these analyses, we asked whether there were differences in the brain as a result of the preschool anxiety status of the individual. Now remember, we scanned them when they were six years old. 
In these analyses, we controlled for their current anxiety levels. So what we found is that anxiety in the preschool period actually predicted this decreased prefrontal connectivity over and above what could be accounted for by their concurrent school age emotional symptoms. So in other words, the decreased connectivity persisted regardless of whether the child still met criteria for an anxiety disorder at the time of the scan. This is really important given the knowledge I presented at the very beginning that anxiety disorders in childhood predict anxiety and mood disorders into adolescence and adulthood. Now the second thing we found is that if you look at the table below these images, you can see that we actually found that while all three anxiety disorders were associated with decreased prefrontal amygdala connectivity, the specific part of the prefrontal cortex to which these differences were found were distinct between each of the anxiety disorders. So for example, if you look at this first row, you will see that social phobia was associated with decreased activation between the amygdala and two ventral regions of the prefrontal cortex, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and the orbital frontal cortex. On the other hand, the second line, you can see that generalized anxiety was associated with decreased connectivity between the amygdala and more dorsal regions of the prefrontal cortex, including the dorsal medial prefrontal and dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Now, if you look back at the images, you can see these differences, with the regions in panel A being more ventral or closer to the bottom of the brain, and the regions in panel B being more dorsal or closer to the top of the brain. And so this suggests that preschool anxiety disorders are differentiated at the level of brain function, providing evidence that there is an underlying neurobiological basis for the phenotypic or behavioral differences that we see between these different anxiety disorders. Again, linking this back to everything we've been talking about, this is important because we're finding that sensory over-responsivity may in fact be related to some anxiety disorders like generalized anxiety while not being related to others. Now, what about sensory over-responsivity? Well, I'm sure by this point, it's absolutely no surprise to learn that these brain networks have also been implicated in sensory over-responsivity. Specifically, in a study by Green and colleagues that looked at the functional brain response to sensory stimuli in children with autism with and without sensory over-responsivity and a controlled group of children they were able to show that amygdala activation, which is seen in this plot here, in response to sensory stimuli in the group of children with autism and sensory over-responsivity, which is this dark blue line, is higher than that seen in children with autism without sensory over-responsivity, the lighter blue dotted line, as well as compared to the control group, which is seen in this black dotted line. In addition, the blocks along the bottom of this axis represent repeated presentations of the sensory stimuli. As you'll notice, both of the dotted lines showing, show decreasing amygdala activity as the task goes on, what we refer to as habituation. However, the same rate of decrease is not seen in the sample of children that have autism and sensory over-responsivity, potentially suggesting that the prefrontal cortex is not doing its job putting the brakes on the amygdala to tell if that all is well and letting the child relax. Indeed, when this group looks specifically at prefrontal amygdala connectivity in these three distinct groups, they found that while children in the group with autism without sensory over-responsivity had high levels of negative amygdala prefrontal connectivity. In other words, the prefrontal cortex is doing a great job and working very hard to dampen the response of the amygdala. The children with autism and sensory over-responsivity seen here do not show the same pattern, but instead had decreased connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, somewhat similar to what we found in our anxious preschoolers. So again, why does this matter? Well, to convince you of why this matters, I first need you to think about the brain being like your muscles. So just like I can go to the gym and do some bench presses to try to increase the strength of my chest muscles, there is evidence that therapies for anxiety can also strengthen the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. 
For example, take cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a common intervention for treating anxiety, which, ha and which has been demonstrated to significantly decrease anxiety symptoms in children with autism. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy has two primary components that are actually working different aspects of brain function. The first is the cognitive part, which focuses on changing the thought patterns responsible for negative emotional and behavioral patterns. The second aspect is the behavioral therapy piece, which includes things like exposure to the stimuli that are causing anxiety. And it, it includes helping the individual learn effective behaviors to replace their ineffective behavioral responses. These different components are basically practicing using the prefrontal cortex to put the brakes on an overactive amygdala. In support of this, an MRI study of the brain basis of clinical improvement following cognitive behavioral therapy in adults with social anxiety has in fact demonstrated that clinical improvement was associated with increased plasticity in the amygdala. So specifically, if you look at these two bottom plots, what you see here is on the x-axis, you see the change in the size of the amygdala in the left amygdala and the right amygdala following the cognitive behavioral therapy treatment, with negative numbers suggesting that these regions have shrunk and positive numbers suggesting that these regions have grown. Now on the left-hand side, you see the change in one of the symptoms of social anxiety, in this case, anticipatory speech anxiety. And what you see is that in the individuals for whom they had negative change, so they showed more um, improvement on this measure, those individuals had smaller amygdala after treatment compared to the um, individuals who did not show the same level of improvement who had, in some cases, bigger amygdala. So this is just one example of a way that we can maybe train our brain, just as we can train a muscle and see actual physical changes. So in this case, it seems as though maybe the amygdala has been overtrained, which you can actually do, um, and it got too big. And in this case, the cognitive behavioral therapy maybe helped to compensate for that, ultimately resulting in a smaller volume of the amygdala in the people who responded to the treatment. There are also newly emerging therapies that target executive functions, which are skills and processes that enable us to plan, to focus our intention, to inhibit competing information, and to achieve our goals. What's important to know about executive functions is that the prefrontal cortex plays a critical role in driving them, and executive differences are implicated across a number of disorders, including both autism and anxiety. So for example, in children with anxiety, and adults with anxiety for that matter, often present with a bias towards focusing on negative information in their environment over and above positive. Specifically, threatening cues tend to capture the attention of individuals with anxiety, and once captured, they then have difficulty disengaging their attention away from that negative information. So folks at the NIH and other places have actually developed a treatment that aims to teach the brain to more flexibly shift attention away from threatening information. This is referred to as attention bias modification training, or ABMT. And it's been shown to be efficacious for treating anxiety in children. Just like with CBT, the amygdala appears to play a role in driving this efficacy for treatment of anxiety. It's a little different here, though. In this study by Britton and colleagues, they found that it was not the change in the amygdala, but rather amygdala activation prior to treatment that predicted response to treatment following the ABMT, ABMT therapy. So if you look over here, what you see is this is activation in the amygdala prior to the actual uh, ABMT training. And on this axis, you see levels of symptom reduction. And what you can see here is that the individuals for whom there was the highest levels of amygdala activation prior to training, that predicted whether they were more likely to, re to see efficacy from the treatment. Now, these authors state that this may suggest that CBT and ABMT may alter the neural circuitry in anxiety disorders in different ways, stating that perhaps while traditional CBT strategies may enhance top-down processes through explicit strategies intended to reduce threat appraisals and increase emotion regulation, 
ABMT may utilize bottom-up processes that implicitly train bias threat-related attention. So that was a lot of words. Why does this matter? Well, if we can identify children who struggle with sensory over-responsivity before they go on to develop an anxiety disorder, and have our psychologists and our occupational therapists and our other amazing, fantastic clinicians work with them to help them practice engaging that prefrontal cortex and decreasing the response to their amygdala when they experience negative sensory stimuli, then maybe, just maybe, we can help some children from progressing from sensory over-responsivity to a full-blown anxiety disorder. I'm happy to say that my colleagues and I are actively working on trying to better understand more about this neurobiology so that we can hopefully make a difference in these children's lives one day. The question, of course, though, is, can it work? Honestly, I can't say at this point whether it can for sure work, but the previous studies give us hope that maybe it can. We still have a lot of work to do, though. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge my unbelievable network of collaborators, colleagues, and mentors who contributed to all of the work I shared today. I also want to recognize the collaborators I'm working with now to take this work to the next level. And of course, recognize the funding that's made this all possible, including my 2015 BBRF Young Investigator Award. And with that, I'm quite happy to take questions. Kim. Thank you for an outstanding presentation. You really were able to connect the dots for, for us, um, both from the clinical standpoint and then what it looks like in the brain and how this can relate to treatment. And, and I also think you, you showed us what children and people in general may be going through. You, you, you really did it in such a sensitive way that you could really we could put ourselves in the shoes of somebody who is experiencing this um, sensory over uh, responsivity. So thank you for, for, for that. Um, thank you. Yeah. The, uh, so I know that you're continuing to do work to figure out what the treatment is. And obviously this is very hopeful as you described how the, the brain can change with treatment. What should a parent do who right now is, is listening to, to the webinar and is it, their child is experiencing this sensory over responsivity that you described, let's say from noises. What should a parent do right now? So I think, you know, the first thing to do is always talk to your pediatrician. But I think if you're very, you know, concerned, the occupational therapists out there, this is like, this is what they do. They're amazing. In fact, my colleagues that, colleagues that I'm working on trying to understand the neurobiology of these um, differences um, and the treatments are both um, occupational therapists. So I'd say find an occupational therapist, find a psychologist to help you and help your child work through these issues so that they don't become an impairing problem or don't continue to evolve into a more impairing problem. Good, so really, if you're seeing this and you're concerned, seek help, seek an evaluation and seek help with treatment. Absolutely. Down the road, as you develop and the field develops a better understanding of this, what types of additional treatments do you see? Do you see treatments such as uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation or other brain stimulation, what types of treatments do you see down the road? Yeah, that's a great question, and I'm not sure I even know that. Um, I can say that part of, you know, what we are trying to understand from the neurobiology isn't just the brain regions that are involved, but the actual um, chemicals in the brain that might be implicated. So one of the chemicals that's shown up multiple times um, is the uh, a neuro, a neurochemical called GABA. Um, and we have, you know, medications that can alter GABA and glutamate in your brain. So potentially, maybe that I'm not, I'm not quite comfortable talking about that level of treatment yet. I think right now our, our first line of defense is definitely going to be the behavioral treatment. Um, especially when we're talking about young kids. But I do think that our, you know, continued ex exploration of the neurobiology of these, um, of these, these um, problems will start to uncover maybe other more 
more neurobiologically based treatments for these things. They, um, I agree. I think that's a very good point. And uh, I just want to switch a little bit to the related issue related to the sensory over responsivity, just to to the anxiety. Because as you pointed out, anxiety in in a child, or adolescent, can potentially be a sign that uh, as an adult they'll have anxiety and or other uh, diagnoses. I'd like you to speak a little bit about what should a parent do if they see that their child is experiencing um, significant anxiety at a young age or, or a little older in, in adolescence? Yeah, again, I think that the same answer, seek help. If you're worried, I always say seek help, right? Talk to your pediatrician, find a good child psychologist, find a occupational therapist. These people are amazing at what they do and they know what they're doing. I'm just studying the neurobiology of what they're doing, but they actually, they, they get in there and they can really make a change. So I'd say just don't hesitate to reach out if you're seeing um, anything concerning in your child that you think might be causing them impairment, right? We just want to promote the best outcomes for absolutely everybody. That's the goal. And the best way to do that is to seek help when you need it. Well said and very important. Children shouldn't have to suffer in silence and parents should um, not hesitate uh, to, to seek out help and evaluation. And parents know their kids. If, if, if you as a parent have a concern, speak to the pediatrician and, and get, get some further advice and, and guidance on that. So uh, excellent, excellent uh, guidance on your part. Um, Kim, I want to again thank you for the extraordinary work that you and your team are doing for this presentation. As you get more information, we're going to bring you back and have you uh, give us more about what you find out in terms of potential treatment. So thank you for all that you do. Thank uh, you. I, I also want to thank everybody who joined us today. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists. All the research we fund is made possible through supporters like you. So please consider making a gift by visiting bbrfoundation.org or call us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with family and friends, please visit the events and webinars page on our website. Finally, I hope that you'll join us again next month when Dr. Yasmin Hurd, the Ward Coleman Chair of Translational Neuroscience, Director of the Addiction Institute and Professor of Psychiatry, Neuroscience and Pharmacologic Sciences at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai will present Addiction, Science Drives New and Novel Treatments. This webinar will take place on Tuesday, April 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you all for joining us and stay well and stay safe. Take care.